once it's working now. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Okay. I guess I should go on the camera where that can be seen. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is August Murphy King. I'm the general manager of the Canadian League of Composers. Thank you for joining us uh, in person and online for the seventh iteration of our Rivers Workshop series, which is a collaboration with the CLC and the Canadian Music Centre Ontario Region, um, hybrid online and in-person uh, in person workshops. Um, today, we are thrilled to be joined by Rachel Kio Iwasa, um, who will be presenting on, um, I guess you can call it a, it's a project or a practice of yours that you've been working on for, for many years, uh, the speaking pianist. Um, so um, rather than the previous Rivers, which was sort of a back and forth interview thing, this will be very much uh, Rachel uh, just talking about her craft, her practice, her approach to, uh, to performance. Um, in terms of, um, actually, I guess I should tell you all a bit about Rachel, just in case you don't know who she is. Um, hailed in the press as a keyboard virtuoso and avant-garde muse uh, with the emotional intensity to take a piece from notes on a page to a stunning work of art. Uh, Rachel is recognized among Canada's foremost contemporary music pianists. Selected to close the ISCM World New Music Days 2017 in Vancouver, Rachel has performed in the Netherlands, Germany, the United States, and all across Canada with engagements including Gadayamas Music Week, Music Toronto, Music on Main, Vancouver New Music, Redshift, Western Front, Vancouver Symphony, Victoria Symphony, the Aventa Ensemble, Contact Contemporary Music, New Works Calgary, Groundswell New Music, and Vancouver Pro Musica. She has commissioned or premiered works by many of Can Canada's most eminent composers, such as Hildegra Hildegard Westerkamp, Rodney Sharman, Jocelyn Morlock, Nicole Lise, Jordan Nobles, Jeffrey Ryan, Farshid Samandari, Marcy Rabe, and Emily Doolittle. One half of the acclaimed contemporary flute duo, Teresias, did I say that right? Teresias? You know, there's so many different pronunciations. That's a good one. Okay, well, you know, sometimes you're just going to take a stab at things. Um, with Mark Takashi Mc McGregor, uh, Rachel has also collaborated with Yannick Neze Sagan, Judith Forst, Heather Posse, the Bozzini Quartet, Pulitzer Prize winning composer Carolyn Shaw, and Richard Reed Perry of Arcade Fire. Her interdisciplinary adventures uh, have led to work with photo based artist S.D. Holman, right director David Bloom, choreographer Tara Cheyenne. The microphone is, there we go, uh, Tara Cheyenne Friedenberg, and multimedia propagateur Paul Wong. So, as you can see, a very impressive resume. Um, and before I turn it over to Rachel, I would uh, like to uh, read the Canadian Music Centre Ontario Region Land Acknowledgement. Uh, as we gather here today, we want to acknowledge that the CMC is in Takaranto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Takaranto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. It is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Chippewa bands and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We thank the Indigenous people who share this land with us and allow us to be here as uninvited guests. The Canadian Music Centre and the Can uh, Canadian League of Composers were both founded in the 1950s. We were established in the context of violent state policies targeting Indigenous communities, including the Potlatch Ban, the 60s Scoop, and residential schools. These policies were not part of some dark chapter, ended and in the past, as injustice and violence against Indigenous people is ongoing. Acknowledging the land is to acknowledge that the CMC, the CLC, and many legacy arts and organizations within Canada have been a part of racist policies that devalue and seek to erase Indigenous cultural expression. We would encourage all community members and all those attending today to familiarize themselves with the 94 calls to action that were released in 2015 as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. We'd also encourage you to follow some of the efforts that the CMC is undertaking to address these calls by viewing the website on our Accountability for Change and Indigenous Advisory Councils. For more information, you can go to cmccanada.org slash accountability for change and cmccanada.org slash indigenous dash advisory dash council. With that, Rachel, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, August. Um, thank you also to Joseph, um, and to the CMC and CLC both for having me here today. Um, my people are Japanese and Danish, and um, both grandparents, sets of grandparents came to this continent 
uh, to settle about 100 years ago. Um, and thank you for that very, uh, very comprehensive land acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge also that my life and my practice are grounded on the exclusions and erasures of many Indigenous peoples, including the ones on whose land we're, from whom we're broadcasting today. Um, and part of that acknowledging for me means that I, um, I make a commitment to help dismantle Canadian settler colonialism. I invite you to make your own commitment as well, and let us carry those commitments forward from this day and out into the world. Um, thank you also to Rodney Sharman to help for helping making the connection to, uh, with CMC and CLC for this lecture today so that I can hear and talk about works for speaking pianists. This is a kind of, um, this is a genre about uh, which I'm really, really passionate. It's known by many other names, including um, melodramas, incidental music, music theater, um, work for vocalizing pianists. Um, it's been around actually for a really long time. Um, go, the first works go back, date back to the 18th century. Um, and some, most of those were seen as um, with one speaker and then other instrumentalists. But we start to see works where the speaker can be a pianist, like one person, a pianist doing their own speaking um, in Schubert and in Liszt. Um, one of the things that really kind of stopped this work or that made it, I think, um, that meant that it didn't flourish as much until more recently is that it works best if you have amplification of the voice. Um, most of us don't have the kinds of, most pianists don't have the kind of theater voice so that we can just talk um, and be heard over a piano. So it was really the advent of microphones and amplification that has unleashed this and this genre and made it possible to be, um, you know, to flower a little bit more. Um, in terms of the vocal amplification, it is also key that you have a decent mic. I used rentals for many, many years. Um, and then as I started to do a little bit more of it, I in invested in a small, like a much more lower profile mic with better sound. I use a Sennheiser. Um, key for that is having also it connects to a whole bunch of different wireless units because a lot of the time, um, I mean, I travel with my own wireless, but a lot of the time it works better if you just plug into the wireless at the house, if the house has a wireless, but then you need a lot of different, you know, you may need a different connector than the like different wireless ones have different connectors. So I've got, I'm not gonna go through the laundry list of brand names here. Um, but yeah, if investing, you wanna get one that has m multiple connections. As you're writing for this, one of the other things to consider with that is because the voice is going to be amplified, consider where you want that sound to come from. Um, most of the time, it's if you're going in with a house amplification, you'll end up with a kind of generalized God voice like we have today coming off of the speakers. Um, but sometimes um, it may be more appropriate to have it spatialized, in which case um, you'd want to have a speaker that's kind of right close to the pianist so that it doesn't, um, so that the sound sounds like it's actually coming from me as opposed to just coming sort of out from the room. Um, if they're singing, it's a good idea to have a monitor because that sure helps to keep in tune <laughs> compared to not having one. Um, with speaking pianist, works for speaking pianist, it is somewhat different than writing for just a, you know, a solo piano voice, I mean a solo piano piece. Um, in terms of the composition part, plan to deliver the score extra early. It takes me at least two times and sometimes three times as long to prepare a work um, where I'm going to be speaking in it as well, um, partly because it's, mul it's multiple steps. I always learn and memorize the text first. Um, and even if I'm playing for music, I always make sure that I memorize the text um, because I find I can't speak it convincingly at all unless it's from memory. Um, and then I learn the notes, then I put the text and the notes together, then I work with a director so that we can um, work on interpretation, I, so I have an outside ear to tell me if my speaking sounds stilted or connected, um, and then also to work on the blocking, I like the physicality of the playing, where in the room I'm going to be delivering my text to, um, 
or delivering my gaze, delivering my speech. Having that outside eye is really, really key, and particularly having someone who's got experience in theater. Um, so make sure that you budget for that uh, uh, in doing this. Uh, my I would like to give a big shout out and thank you to David Bloom, who is the director, the Vancouver-based director who I work with. Um, he's a playwright, actor, and director, and fight choreographer, and we are still looking for an opportunity to use that fight choreography in one of these pieces. We also need then extra time uh, to f in the tech dress to troubleshoot for the miking, for the tech, for the balance, and all of that. So those are all considerations that go that, you know, when planning for a piece like this should go into your, um, should go into your timelines and into your budgets. Some other considerations. Um, when you're going to have speaking, like keep the piano part simple at the time when the voice is going to be going at the same time. Um, even with amplification, if there's a lot happening in the piano, it can be hard to understand the text if both things are very active at the same time. And also just consider it's speaking and playing at the same time are hard. <laughs> if you've ever tried to do them, it's hard just to do, and then it's hard to do well. So um, even things that, are re that feel relatively simple are much more complicated when there's that extra layer on top. There's a lot in common between writing for speaking pianists and writing for song. So like in song, um, it's really important that the inflections um, match, match the language. But even more than in song, you really notice when someone is speaking, if the emphasis comes on the wrong syllable, it's, um, you really notice, um, unlike song, well, in song, it works fine if you prolong a syllable. No one blinks an eye at that, but it sure sounds strange when you're speaking. So when writing for, when you're going to be writing for, for speaking pianist, really making sure that you've spoken all of the text aloud yourself, that you've spoken it as much as you can with, um, with the timing of the music will make, it, will make it key to whether that's able to be performed in a convincing way. Um, if that's particularly key if you're going to be notating the rhythms, and we'll be showing some examples of that a little bit later. Um, if the rhythms are not notated, it can be more difficult to communicate how you want the text to be emphasized. Or rather, there's a lot more variation when you're speaking to where you can put the emphasis compared to um, if it's sung and it's metered. So. Um, but there are many, many ways to be to em to show emphasis on particular syllables or which words, uh, whether that's with an italics or whether you can choose your own notation. But just be clear on that in the performing notes. Um, as a courtesy, it's also wise to to provide the full text in your um, in your introduction or performance notes, because if you don't, then it just means that the pianist is going to have to write them all out um, and separate from the text, partly for learning them, because as I say, it, it makes sense to be memorizing the text in advance of playing it, and that's a lot faster to do if it's all on, you know, if it's all on one or two sheets compared to spread out through the score. Um, but then also for program notes or liner notes, um, again, just much easier if you can provide that rather than leaving it to the performer uh, to do that. Another consideration w with text, if you are if your text carries you from a number of in a number of different places, um, notating that in place of an expressive marking is really useful. And we'll look at a few examples of that, including we're going to start with um, where I started my journey with sp for speaking pianist with The Garden by Rodney Sharman, which is from 2001. The text is by playwright Peter Elliott Weiss. Um, and it tells a story of a gay man visiting a notorious sex club and experiencing a single life-changing kiss. Um, I'm going to play uh, the opening section of this, which is I have the score up here for the moment, but I'm going to just switch on to playback. This 
This is it, the garden, a club for men. <laughs> I've heard so much about it. I've been excited all day. All through the meetings, all through the dullness, all through the greetings and motions and voting. It felt like forever. They asked my opinion. I told them, whatever. In my head, the motions. No one had a notion where I would be soon. I've been hard since now. I'm here. I'm standing on the threshold at last. And I stop cold. So you can see here there's a number of different approaches here in terms of notating the language compared to the music. So Ronnie starts it out with at the very top spoken word that doesn't have any music with it and coming in with the uh, piano a little bit later. This was a place where, until I talked to Rodney, I actually found this a little bit ambiguous, and I was trying to say it over top of all of this involved piano playing, and then was couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it to project. It wasn't until a little later that I, until I actually t asked Rodney about it. He's like, oh, no, 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 that's supposed to be by itself. So because, again, this is not uh, kind of music that most people who do this are necessarily familiar with. It's really good to be very explicit about what you have in mind for that. I think of another piece by Rodney, um, his opera transcription of Tristan and Isolde, where the pianist sings close to the end of it. And Rodney was telling me a story about another pianist who learned it, and when she played it for him, he said, well, why didn't you sing? And she said, oh, you mean I was actually supposed to sing that? I thought that was like, you know, in Schumann's Carnival, where it was, you know, he'll, you know, where Schumann has, you know, these 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 words in there that are meant only for inspiration, or at least we're, we're not sure whether he meant them to be spoken aloud. But most pianists don't actually say them. She just assumed that that was just to, that it was uh, an expressive marking something for to show inspiration, and because um, it hadn't occurred to him to write pianist sings here. Um, because it seemed obvious to him, but again, because it's so, it's not something that pianists are usually asked to do. You really do need to spell that out. Um, you can see then next these sections that are um, where the rhythm is notated very specifically, um, standard rhythmic notation, but without note heads. Uh, Rodney's done a really terrific job in terms of making this easy to speak. Um, A little bit later, you can see he moves to a notation where there's mu music stops, there's a fermata, and then um, the text is written just in a block so that the timing is much freer for the pianist. And then just after that, places where the note, the music for the hands is the rhythm is uh, the has a very has a notated rhythm. That goes on independently while the voice is left to be free and kind of fit in, connected to that. Every one of these approaches, um, I mean, we see each one of them in a lot of different music. The toughest one to, well, actually, I'm not sure which is more difficult, is to do the, the places where you're, where the where the voice has rhythmic notation or whether the you know where the voice doesn't the the easiest one is of course the fermata and then you speak um, when I first learned this I found it I found the sections where the voice was notated with specific notation quicker to learn to put together because because um, then I knew where to speak and I didn't have to make those decisions 
but in as I got further in my interpretation, it was actually it's actually harder to do that part to do those rhythms really convincingly and not sound like you're yeah make it sound spontaneous um, compared to the places where it's a little bit freer for me to know where I'm putting things in. Um, Again, the difficulty level, it's more just a question of knowing how much you're demanding of your pianist and how long it's going to take them to learn it. Um, this piece is very much written as a piece, a piece of drama or of a piece of theater. The text is in first person. I am, as a pianist, I'm playing a character. And um, the the place or the setting of what's happening travels with me. And so one of the things that I find really interesting about the way Rodney has then used the music is that he uses the music as the way of transforming and taking us from one location to another. So the part that you heard at the beginning there, um, that's where the main character is in his day job at the office. You heard the transition going to standing outside the club where we had new music for that. Um, and then he starts to transform into different sections. So, for example, the next section he moves into his grandmother's garden. Um, which is a mix of... Because suddenly I think of my old nonna. My grandma and me, a kid on her knee in the garden. He also has sections in this where the um, where the pianist sings. We'd sit in her arbor. She'd hold me and sing. Learn from me when you are young. You see with your eyes, but to see with your heart makes you wise. Which incidentally, that's also a consideration. I'm, I, this piece was not written for me, um, and, but I was really lucky that the vocal range actually fits my vocal range exactly. If you're going to be, um, if you want the piece to be performed by multiple people, it's worth considering whether that's something that you do like songs having multiple different, um, multiple different possibilities and different voice types. Um, or also considering whether you want to keep this as something that's available to a specific vocal range only. Uh, so we've gone from Nana's Garden. We go from there into a transitional section of entering the club. When we get into the club, we have music that's very specific to that. The I walk through the door to the garden. Oh, let me move that. I walk through the door to the garden. Inside? Oh my. No place to hide. I wouldn't even try. So this is an interesting example here, I find, of something that looks really simple on paper. Um, because the hands are just doing to, you know, it's just repeating the same thing over and over. And the rhythms shift. And so Rodney was, uh, was like, but this, you know, I'm only asking you to play the same notes. It was initially notated for me to be turning around backwards on that gliss and then playing it back this way, which I am I am still hoping to get to the point um, where I am able to do that. But uh, it's been 20 years and I'm still not quite there yet. I do every time I bring it up again. I try like I bring the piece back. I try it and I'm getting closer every time. Um. And 
then once we get after we get into the club, he has a flashback to his high school boyfriend. We met in high school. He was a dream. Traveling into this kind of doo wop music. Boys like to kiss boys. Girls like to kiss girls. Some call kissing politics. I like kissing just for kicks. We move back into the we move back into the club. When that finishes, back into the present, with with some snapping and then free rhythm over that. From there, and you can see where Ronnie's notated this into the garden again, showing this showing as the um, as the expressive marking the change in play. Then we move from there, so we move from the club into going out back, which and then has another new. So dark. I never thought it would be so dark. Hands reach. So again, a complete change in sound world, which helps transport. into a new place and then when the when the protagonist takes sends back into memory Rodney again uses the music from the previous section from the grandmother's section e miracolo il cuore e go to help the audience and the pianist carry from one place to another so unlike that kind of idea, that Aristotle, Aristotelian ideal of a unity, a place and action all in one spot, because we have here um, the soundtrack that we're creating at the same time on the piano, we have a lot more possibilities um, in terms of really staging the work through the musical sound. As I noticed, this is as you noticed this, or as I noted, this is a song about a gay man visiting a notorious sex club for the first time. You may be wondering how that works with a female pianist. Um, when Rodney, I mean Rodney wrote this piece in two thousand and one. We had, we had re met only a couple of years before, and he told me he was working on this. And I said, Oh, you know, I'm really interested in works for speaking pianists. Um, you know, can you give me the, you know, I. Can I take a look at the score? And he kind of paused and he said, oh, he said, you know, Rachel, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that because the gender of the pianist seems to be really important. Uh, you know, it's, about a, it's a gay male story. And I was like, okay, I can totally respect that. We went um, to a concert together not that long after where the pianist was speaking, uh, was performing one of the most famous works for speaking pianist, uh, Frederick Jeffsky's De Profundis, where the text comes from Oscar Wilde's letter to Lord Alfred Douglas from prison. And um, it was being done by a, by a female pianist. And I asked her about that, like, how does, you know, how, how do you feel, like, how do you feel about that implication about the gender? And she said, Oh, you know, I think it's way better when this is done by a woman because then the gay thing doesn't come into it at all. Which I I was really taken aback because, of course, Oscar Wilde going to prison, well, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for it, the gay thing. Like this, that the gender, um, the homosexuality of the text is really key to actually understanding what's going on. So after that was, uh, after that was over, and Rodney and I were chatting about it. I said, you know, I think I, st I still want to do De Profundis, but I think I'm going to perform it in drag. And uh, a week later, Rodney showed up with the score um, of The Garden on my doorstep. So, so this is me um, performing The Garden in drag. Um, this was a couple of days ago at the um, at Array Music. Um, so you know, I st I make a pretty effeminate man, but I you know it's it does 
this is the first time I've ever even done excerpts of the garden without being in drag because for me it's a really the gender of the protagonist is a really inherent part of the piece so that's another thing to consider when writing um for me for speaking pianist is does the gender of does like when you're choosing a text does that specify a specific gender for the pianist what are the possibilities for that now i recently um recorded this on a cd um and it was one of the questions I had was because I'd always used drag to indicate gender. I was like, okay, well, do I need to be thinking, um, if I don't have those visual, those visual signifiers to indicate the gender of the protagonist, do I need to be looking at mass learning how to masculinize my voice? Um, and I'm really grateful to, um, the playwright, Sonny Drake for helping me kind of think through this. Um, if you don't know Sonny's work, check it out. He's an amazing, amazing playwright. Um, a trans man and he was telling, we were talking about that and he said, he commented that voice is not necessarily as gendered as we think it is. Um, I can think of people who I've misgendered on the phone. He, Sonny said he gets misgendered on the phone all the time and then asked me, you know, does, do I think that makes him less of a man because people hear his voice, you know, with ambiguous gender. So it made me realize that I could, I mean, of course, the obvious answer to that is no. Um, I didn't need, you know, so I just went with my, you know, there's a full range of expression I have for my voice. And yes, I sound like an effeminate man, but there are lots of men who sound pretty effeminate too. And that's, um, that's been part of my journey with this piece. Um, the next piece that I want to talk about is a piece called Klavierklang by Hildegard Westerkamp. Um, I'm going to start by playing a couple of clips from this. Um, this is a piece from 2017 for piano, stereo soundtrack, and spoken text. Um, Hildy describes this as saying, Klavierklang is a sonic musical journey into the complexities of piano playing. During the creation of the piece, pianist Rachel Iwasa and I often reflected on the challenging and traumatic, but also inspiring experiences we've had with piano teachers, the roles our mother's ears played in our musical development and how much the piano has been both a sanctuary for sonic exploration and sound making and a site of trauma and discouragement. Ultimately, Clavier Klang is a journey towards the piano playing we've always loved and into the magic of its sound. Oops, that was not as smooth as I was hoping it would be. Maybe we keep that off of full screen. Yep, I am going to reload. Oh, the magic of the internet. Next time I'll make sure I download all of my clips before we do this. Okay, let's try that again. after her music studies, she had a nightmare. She was in a piano exam. The piano they had given her made no sound. Outraged, she demanded an audible piano. Another one was brought in. She started playing. But there were barbed wire fences, miniature ones run between the keys of B and C in every octave. For a while, she actually tried to stretch her fingers across each one of them, beeping high enough so as not to get hurt, but then, exasperated, she stopped playing, got up in protest, and woke up in a cold sweat.
Yes. It was a nightmare. But she found the strength to protest. The judges could not intimidate her any longer. That made her happy. So the visuals for that are um, from the rough cut of an upcoming film, short film, directed by Nettie Wilde that we're working on with, uh, that Hildy and I are working on with her. Um, the, final co the final version of that is going to look quite a bit different. Um, but this is the, yeah, this is just the kind of some few f short sections of that. Um, Oh, and again, my queuing didn't quite. Uh, didn't last through my. Um, the gaps in between the timing. Barbed wire. This. Day, she found a piano in an abandoned house in the interior of British Columbia. It had been there for many years. Some strings, keys, and hammers were broken. Rats and mice had left their traces upon the soundboard. She couldn't wait to play it. How would it sound? This piano did not scare her. It was impossible to make mistakes on it. It was already ruined. And there were no judging ears for miles. She was open, free, experimenting, listening. So you can see there's a number of different uh, approaches to the text here as well. Um, and it's, I love the way that Hildy has notated this. Um, in this case, unlike um, Rodney's approach of having bars underneath it um, and kind of, and um, syncing up with the music that way, Hildy's gone with a three staff approach showing on the top staff what I'm actually doing on the piano, the parts that I'm doing on the piano. The second staff, um, the words that I'm going to be speaking. And then underneath, showing using a waveform to show the audio track so that you can see where the peaks go with specific timings in there. And then also indicating in that track um, very, you know, what the cues are for me to be listening to. Um, in terms of music for piano and electronics, it's a really beautiful way of notating it um, because it means that I can come in at any one of these spots on the soundtrack um, as for places to practice. There's lots of places to be coming in as opposed to I've, a number of works I've done with piano and electronics will only show a cue like once every minute or so, but in terms of practicing, a minute is a long time to be going in and out. Um, so she's got a mix between places where the piano is doing, um, is doing things that are somewhat, um, like, where the rhythms of the, of the voice are free over fairly simple things, simply notated music in the piano. There's other places where the, um, you know, that the, where the piano, again, the piano rhythm, the, the spoken rhythms are free, but then what's being done in the piano is 
somewhat improvised. So you heard the kind of broken up Chopin there. So that she's notated the Chopin, but you're, it's up to me to decide how I'm going to interface that with the piano so that I can kind of stop it and start it. Um, and then there's the other places, um, and you hear that towards the end, where the um, and this show this is an example. This is the score here from the place, um, the last excerpt that I played, uh, where you see that the voice was on the um, voice was on the soundtrack. Um, so there's recorded pre-recorded speech that's integrated into the soundtrack. Uh, this is, so the approach here is much more, is very, very multi-layered. Rather than a single narrator, that's the character, we have a couple of different narrators. We have one that's speaking in third person about a protagonist with she, her pronouns. Then you hear on the recorded track, um, a you know, a narrator speaking from first person with I, me, my pronouns. So it's an approach in terms of the, um, of a text that's really multi-layered, which very much echoes um, and goes together with uh, Hildegard Westerkamp's kind of a collage-like approach for um, working with environmental sound. And so the piano, the spoken voice, then all of the different aspects of the pre-recorded soundtrack all work in this very mul polyvocal, multi-layered kind of approach, which is also what the film is eventually, I mean, well, well, what the film is going to look like. We have actually finished the final, we have finished the fine cut for that, um, but that is not, uh, I don't have authorization to show that just yet. Part of the vocal polyvocality also has to do with the way that this piece was composed. Um, the spoken text is written by Hildy, and that's that's her own story. The pre-recorded text was um, taken from an interview that Hildy recorded. Hild Hildegard interviewed me, and then pre-recorded it, and then cut it up and layered it for use in the soundtrack. For this one. Because also reflecting that kind of multi-layered approach, the speakers also get spatialized so that there's um, God voice speakers on the on the PA doing the soundtrack, then my vocal mic, which is coming through um, a speaker that comes close to the piano. So again, that it's clear that my voice is coming from a different place than the voice on the soundtrack. Um, and then also uh, the piano is, is amplified so that the extended techniques can be mixed. So this is in this kind of approach, um, it really does require somebody on a mixing board. Up until now, that has always been Hildy, but you know she spent quite a bit of time in that um, and working with the score. And this beautiful score here was done by John Oliver. Um, you might have noticed when you were looking at the judges some cameos. John Ol John Oliver is one of the cameo is one of the judges there. You can see his spiky hair, and then um, Rodney Sharman. You can also recognize from that uh, from that very char characteristic beard. And the third um, the third judge is uh, Jackie Le Jacqueline Leggett. Jackie Leggett. So we have a nice little cameo from three CMC associate composers. Um, because of the different speakers and the different sound sources, this is a piece that takes about three hours to tech. So that is that it has been to some degree limiting in terms of where I can perform it. So that's again something to be considering um, in terms of writing it, whether the tech is going to be something that um, you're going to be able to negotiate with venues or not. Um, luckily, it being Hildegard Westerkamp, every venue we've had has been willing to bend over backwards for her um, when they can. There's certain possibilities where, if, you know, and on certain, particularly in um, smaller cities where they may not have the capacity, they may not have the, um, simply they just don't have enough equipment. And so that has impacted to some degree the performability of this piece. It's one of the reasons why we made a movie. Um, last one I want to talk about, to, piece I want to talk about today is um, another piece by Rodney Sharman um, called Wounded. Uh, 
This is, uh, so it's Wounded in Memoriam of Claude Vivier. This is um, from Rodney's third book of opera transcriptions because it started out as a transcription of Vivier's Copernicus. But it quickly morphed into um, more of a storytelling from Rodney's perspective and his friendship with the great Claude Vivier um, and Vivier's own, his links between Eros and Thanatos. Um, this text is all by Rodney. Um, he did workshop it with me speaking it so that he could hear how it was going to sound in my voice. And then we also worked on it together with, um, with my director, David Bloom, before Rodney even started writing the music. So that the text was workshopped and um, just as carefully as, um, as uh, any music would be. Here's a short sample. We speak only in German. Lonely child? May have been the only English words he ever said to me. In Paris, some 40 years ago, to speak German loudly, proudly, was at best to invite contempt. Pushing through the crowded foyer, a large white cotton bandage taped to his neck. Rod, guck mal meine Narbe he cried, proudly displaying the wound. <sighs> Look at my scar! <sighs> Look at my scar. So Rodney's chosen at this point. Um, for this work to be almost exclusively places where the um, music stops over fermata and you notice he's very explicitly saying spoken where the pianist is to speak. But each time the music stops, there's room for me to say my text at whatever tempo is working well for me on the day, in the venue on the day. Um, one of the things to note with this is that making that transition from speaking to playing is also, though easier than doing speaking and playing at the same time, whatever I'm doing after I speak, um, the transition into the playing is quite challenging. And so putting a very difficult run or something that's um, something very fast right after, again, you know, just know that you're asking your pianist to do something that's a lot harder than it would seem just compared to coming in after a rest. Um, the other place that I wanted to show for this is towards the end of that piece. Love. Beauty. Desire. Night. Thank you to Music on Main for that beautiful, making that beautiful video. So here you can see the text is, is more closely integrated with the, into the flow with the music. The Rodney again has here chosen, he still uses the fermatas, um, 
but because with the text uh, with much shorter bits of text which means that we don't has quite have that same feeling of music stops and then I speak um, but again he's given a fermata to tell me that I'm free to decide how long it's going to be but also makes a point of saying wait so that there's a you know so that I know that they're not meant to come one directly after the other in this case um, the text is in first person from the perspective of the composer and then because because for this one because the music also from the perspective of the composer I didn't feel the need um, nor did Rodney give me the indication that I was intended to do Rodney Sharman drag for this to me it felt it was I think we both agreed that it was obvious enough music's from the perspective of the composer Texas perspective from the composer, I am performing them both as the interpreter, as myself. Um, so yeah, three different approaches to uh, approaching text music for speaking pianist. Um, the two works by Rodney Sharman are available or will be available on March 22nd at launch my new recording on Redshift Records, Unknown and Unknown Solo Piano Works by Rodney Sharman um, is going to be launching in just a few weeks. Um, Klavierklang is available on Irsay Music. Um, that recording just came out a couple of months ago. So um, we're at about an hour. So I'm going to call it a, a that's, that's what I have prepared for today. Do we have any questions in the last few minutes that we have left? Is that on? Is Sounds like it from here. OK. So um, as Rachel just mentioned, uh, first of all, thank you for the, what was it? I'm, right, I'm off camera now. So that's why it's a little voice of God. Um, thank you for what was a really cool presentation. Um, I will, I've put a link to the YouTube video of, the, um, of Rodney's piece. And I'm just going to put in some links to the Western Camp record and the um, and Rodney's new record on so that if anyone wants to pre-order Rodney's or or get this one that's on the uh, Clavier Clang, you can check that out. Um, as Rachel said, does anyone have any questions or or thoughts or inquiries? I actually did have one um, based on the first piece, the Garden, um, because I noticed you had a fair bit of vocal inflection as well. And I, I couldn't see it. Was that when Rodney was was notating the text? Was he sort of giving like directionality to, or was that your own sort of you built that in from interpretation and from working with with a dramaturg or director or whichever? Yeah, that's built. So Rodney doesn't indicate any of that at all. Um, that's based on my own interpretation. And there's another recording of this um, by Anthony Demar on his album Speak. Uh, which is on Innova Records. He recorded that in about 2010, where you can hear a completely different approach to the piece, where um, a Tony's gone with a much more, much more neutral, less theatrical, less dramatic approach to doing the text, um, which are both, yeah, completely legitimate interpretive choices. And you find different pianists will, the different interpreters will do that differently. And if you as a composer have a more, you know, have a preference for one for or one or the other, it would be good probably to indicate that. Okay, thank you. Just a question of curiosity for uh, the garden piece. Um, I noticed that uh, Rodney composed and written out certain text to be specifically in certain rhythm and then he decided certain actions that it's just a fermata or just a chord and then just a whole bunch of text did he had a personal reason of why he decided to go between the two because um, I just wonder when he had the text uh, without the specific rhythm whether he heard it in a certain version or whether he just wanted to leave it open so just a question about curiosity, whether you have any idea. I think for the most part, the places where the um, 
where the text is specifically notated, that's a place where the music is also very rhythmic. And so there's a kind of almost a kind of hocket approach going back and forth between the voice and the music. The places where he's done um, music notated in rhythm, but, um, but voice freer are places where the music tends to drift a little bit more. It's a little bit, it tends to be dreamier. And so I think he just, you know, he left that so that it would be a little bit more free floating. Um, it is much harder to have text in specific rhythms and have it sound kind of floaty. Um, Frederick Jeffke's De Profundis, he notates all of the rhythms for all of the texts and particularly where the music tends to be much more um, yeah, much more but diaphanous. It is very hard to actually get those rhythms and not not have it sound like I'm trying to speak in eighth notes and sixteenth notes. Um, I mean, and again, there are many pianists who choose an interpretation where those where that rhythm is much more um, much more defined. You know, and it's I mean, as you're as I'm talking about that with you now, it's just occurring to me that I would you know it might. For, for rhythmic text, you know, next time I do that, maybe I'll see if I can get a mentorship with a rapper because that might help me actually do that in a more convincing way. I just put a link to a video of Deep De Profundis because that has come up a couple times. Um, so I don't have any Zoom questions. I have a couple I'm curious about because um, I know we've looked two composers today, and we've mentioned uh, the Shevsky piece. Are there other, what's the word, kind of like canonical or iconic? If people really want to like dig into this and see, kind of get a, 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 a really dive into rep, is there other composers, other artists, performers, or, or pieces that, you, that strike you as sort of like, you know, iconic examples of this approach? Yes. So an iconic Canadian composer who does this a lot also is Diana McIntosh. Um, she did a lot of her own, I mean, I, to a large degree, she was performing these works herself as well as composing them. Uh, but she's got a quite a large body of work for this particular um, genre. Um, the composer Michael J. Park, Vancouver-based composer, um, is also writing quite a bit of music in this genre and he also performs it himself. Um, the American composer Kate Soper has some really interesting examples of this, as well as, as I said, going back into the canon. Um, this Abschied von der Erde by Schubert is an interesting early example. Um, der Traurige Mönch, or The Sad Monk by Liszt, is one that I really like. Those ones are both called mellow, at the time they were written, they were called melodramas. And um, the Liszt in particular very much leans into what we, I mean, now when we talk about melodrama, we think of more like soap operas and things that are, you know, a little bit over the top in the emotion. The list really leans into that in a very fun way. It's kind of this like horror movie. Um, I mean, obviously not a movie because there weren't movies yet when List was alive, but very much in that kind of gothic horror genre. Another really interesting case of this is um, Claude Debussy's Chanson de Biditis, most people are familiar with the three songs and don't know that he also wrote um, a set of music of, I think it's 14 pieces. Um, I should know that because I wrote my doctoral dissertation on that, but that was quite some time ago. Um, he published them under the title of Incidental Music. And at the time they were performed with one person doing the speaking, um, a small ensemble of th um, three harps, three flutes and a celesta doing the music. Um, and then um, a group of a group of actors acting and kind of doing what they called in those days tableau vivant. They would create one a sort of st stand in one position as kind of a still life of, of the scene. Um, so that's another, uh, yeah, another really interesting example of it with the poetry of Pierre Louis, so same poet as uh, for the songs, the Chanson de Bidities. So those would be my, um, those would be the one off the top of my head. Uh, the, the recording that Anthony DeMar um, 
put out that includes the garden has is entirely works for speaking piano so it has another uh, uh, quite a number of interesting examples uh, notably by laurie anderson as well sorry i'm scrambling to, to, to get that information into the uh into the chat there but i think we'll send a little email out to everybody just with some of this information um do you have any other questions you'd like to add? good so i don't have any more questions in the chat so i think um I would like to say thank you so much to Rachel for her time and her expertise and what was, I thought, a very inspiring presentation. And um, I think it was mentioned earlier in the chat, but we will have this. Well, it's being it's been recorded and we'll end up on our on our on the CMC and CLC YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and reference anything and um, and you know get any information from this chat it will be uh, online uh, shortly so with that um, thank you so much Rachel thanks August thanks and thanks to the CMC and CLC for having me and thanks everyone for coming <laughs>